Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalie Delap. I'm the Operations Director for the Humboldt County Growers Alliance. HCGA is the trade association representing licensed cannabis businesses in Humboldt County. We are pleased to present with you a week of education at our Cannabis Genetics and Bioethics Conference, which is produced in partnership with Hendricks Farms. Thank you, Daniel. Every day this week at 11 a.m., we will be bringing to you different tools of the trade. Today, we have micro farming. Tomorrow, viruses, viroids, and pathology. On Wednesday, tissue culture and meristematic restoration in cannabis. Thursday, gene editing for yield and stress tolerance. And Friday at 11 a.m., genetic storage for common access. And then again at 11, at 1 p.m. on Friday, a cannabis breeders rights panel brought with Nat Pennington from Humboldt Seed Company, Jerry Whittington of LeBlanc CNE, Jesse Dodd from BioVortex, Sunshine Johnson, Sunbolt Grown, Eleanor Kunst of LeafWorks DNA, and all of this will be moderated by Colleen Byers of Breeders Best. It is during that panel presentation that we will be discussing everything that was presented this week. I wanna remind people that all of these events need to be registered for independently, and you can do so at hcga.co under the events page. And now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Heather Luther, to talk about our 420 event and how, our, uh, how we're sponsoring this event. Thanks, Natalyn. Hi everyone, so I would love to invite you to our four o'clock 420 celebration. Um, we're gonna be joined by G-Love of G-Love and Special Sauce to perform a couple songs. Then we're gonna head over to Don Carlos live in the greenhouse, who's gonna help lead us all in a little 420 celebration session. So hope to see you all there. We're also gonna have some comedy by Savage Henry. So we've got a real fun lineup for you. Go to that same website that Natalyn just said, HCGA hcga.co slash genetics bioethics conference and you can sign up for each webinar there. I'd really love to thank our sponsors for our entire event um, and that is Rocky Mountain Cannabis Consulting, Tag Risk Insurance, Rad Source Technology, and Valks Amendments. Bonus points if you can spot the product placements in my background here. It's a little Where's Waldo. Um, so today for this webinar, our, our main sponsor is Rocky Mountain Cannabis Consulting. So their training courses, expert counsel, procedures, and documents help businesses achieve and maintain compliance. RMCC helps operators and technology companies excel in daily operations, implement seed to sale software, provide comprehensive training, and build the infrastructure of compliance operations through customized standard operating procedures, on-site evaluations, and risk analysis. So go on over and check out RMCC's Emerald Triangle package offered to operators across the supply chain in Humboldt, Mendo, and Trinity. The package includes multiple metric evaluations, on-site training, and virtual consultation hours. Visit rmcc.io for more details. Again, that's rmcc.io, or you can email their team at farmerrelations at rmcc.io. So thanks to Rocky Mountain Cannabis Consulting. Back over to you, Natalyn. Thanks, Heather. And with that, I'd like to introduce Daniel Hendricks of Hendricks Farms to announce our panel today. Hey everybody, uh, thanks for coming, happy 420. We uh, put this panel together, uh, every all the speakers, uh, because we just learned about some really amazing people and technology over the last couple of years of cannabis legalization and specifically last summer. So we really wanted to introduce all these concepts uh, to everybody. It costs a lot of money to go to all these different places and learn about these different topics. And uh, originally it was gonna be in person. And then uh, with the COVID-19 interruption, we, we transferred it to a digital conference. And that was really when we put extra focus on today's panel, which is about micro farming, uh, medicine, and basically taking your crop and, and, and planning that victory garden. So uh, we want to introduce Daniel from Bryceland Forest Farm. He's our humble delegate and, and he's going to lead us through uh, this presentation by Chris Fairney. 
Hey everyone, this is Daniel, Daniel Stein from Bryceland Forest Farm. We're a, a small cannabis and veggie farm in, in Southern Humboldt out here in Bryceland. Um, and I am moderating this panel because it is such uh, an exciting uh, subject for me and one of my lifelong passions to um, figure out how to integrate food farming and food growing into into our industry as cannabis and into our lives as as people to improve our lives and improve our our sustainability and our self sufficiency as community. So, with that in mind, I'd really love to uh, introduce the the panelists. Chris Verney um, studied biointensive farming and diet design with John Jev Jevons Ecology Action down in Willits. Um, and during that time was getting a degree in ecological agriculture from New College. Since then, Chris has started Northwest Cultivation, which is a, a sustainable eco-minded hemp nursery with, uh, located in, in Connecticut with a focus on and a specialty on, on feral hemp genetics with your unique terpene and cannabinoid profiles. So, Chris has put a lot of time and thought into um, sustainably growing food and especially sustainably growing food and uh, hemp and cannabis together with a focus on providing a complete diet for, for humans. So um, I'd like to pass it over to Chris. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, like Daniel said, thank you for the introduction and I'm truly honored to be here. Uh, I find myself in Sharon, Connecticut by way of uh, Sonoma County in uh, Sebastopol, Northern California. And uh, I have a background in, in farming cannabis and food for, gosh, almost 20 years now. Um, and the topic today is uh, biointensive uh, farming uh, within the micro farm um, design. So, you know, basically to start with, micro farming is, is considered, you know, a farm that's under five, you know, it's around five acres or less, right? So this is an area of land that is most accessible to people. It's not overwhelming. It's something that somebody can do in their backyard. It's somebody, you know, you can do it on a little bit bigger of a scale, um, but it, it, it's a different uh, style of farming. Um, it has different intention. Um, it's more sustainably minded and it enables people to develop more of a connection to where their food and medicine is coming from. Um, within this, you know, there are obviously different types of farming, um, and one of the, the main tenets of farming that I studied is biointensive agriculture. So biointensive agriculture has been around for hundreds of years. You know, it started in, in China and Greece. Uh, the Mayans were farming biointensively. Um, and it's been developed over the years through multiple cultures and it basically enables you to use the, you know, to maximize your production in the most, the minimal amount of space possible. Um, you know, this was then developed originally by Alan Chadwick, um, which was taking a biodynamic and French intensive methodology and further developed by John Jevons over the last, I mean, he's been around for the last 50 years or so. Um, and this was in Willits, California, where his one of his main farm is, and it takes you know you know ecological, organic, and regenerative methods of farming take precedent, you know, while working within these methodologies. Um, there are eight. We'll go. I'm just going to kind of briefly go over some kind of some of the basic uh, principles and premises of, of biointensive uh, farming. There basically are eight uh, main principles, and the biggest thing that I think um was attractive to me was you know it's farming with intention you know we're doing things for very specific reasons um there th there's just a lot of thought that goes into the way that you know the you're interacting with the earth with the plants um you know while you're cultivating so you know one is deep quality or, or deep soil quality so there's a technique called double digging so double digging your beds um, essentially is you're, you're fluffing your soil up, you're creating these really uh, aerated uh, beds with the ability to have a high water retention. Um, 
you know, another premise is bio intensively planting, which essentially is, you're, you know, you're utilizing closer plant spacing while doing so. So uh, conventional, you know, conventional plant spacings, you may be, you know, taking them down by half when you're planting bio intensively, you're planting on center. Um, it's just a different style of planting, which, you know, helps in many ways that, you know, you're creating a microclimate, you're helping to suppress weeds, you're uh, actually, you're creating the ability to use less water um, by doing so. And there, you know, another aspect of this is, is called, is functional biodiversity, which basically takes into account um, companion planting, allelopathic relationships, um, also looking into you know planting native plants whenever possible, and you're planting uh, for beneficial um, you know insects and um, flora and fa other fauna in the area, and you know a lot of this comes to um, the idea of we're planting to 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 feed both people and we're planting to feed the earth, right? So everybody has to eat, everybody has to support themselves, but at the same time, how are we able to give back? to the soil while doing this. So we're planting for financial and uh, food stability as well as we're, we're planting um, to create carbon for the soil. Um, this is done through certain things like effective composting, different compost methodologies that are applied, a lot of which uh, I'll go into in a minute. Um, also, it's just um, taking back our food security. So one of the biggest things uh, involved is is seed sovereignty. We're seed saving and we're breeding locally acclimatized strains um, of you know vegetables, cannabis, whatever it might be. So we're able to to give the ownership back to the farmer uh, and community and and to take control of this uh, while farming in a biointensive mindset. Um, and overall, the the eighth premise is just looking at it um, with a whole farm. Uh, system of sustainability. So it's a it's a holistic, systematic way of thinking. Aside from just planting one crop or another, it's how it's it's taking into every interaction into play. Um, so you know, through all of this, we think um, we're farming, and there. What is the intention of doing so? So one thing that I studied was was okay, our diet and diet design. How do we interact with the world? What do we take away? What do we as humans need as far as nutrition? How do we then translate that into what we need to plant? Say what it was, was how, how do you grow all of your own food, your own uh, calories for, a, for one year uh, on less than an acre? Um, so this is really focusing on the interaction between the reliance that we have on the earth, you know, the soil and the interaction that we have and reliance on ourselves. Uh, we really have to take a look at um, what our specific needs are, or you know, how much do we need calorically? Um, what is our general nutrition? And take this all into consideration. A lot of the things that you know we don't really have to think about on a daily basis. Um, and I thought that this was really interesting because we, you know, we, we're farming and we're, you know, we're, we're taking out of the land and we're growing food and we're growing other crops, but we're, you know, I was never really thinking, well, what does it actually take to, to make, you know, to fuel my body, to make this happen? And it's a way of quantifying what we need. Um, so, you know, this is all individual. This, it's, it's, it changes from individual to individual. There's a lot of different thought that goes into this, different types of diets, but, you know, we can all kind of come together and realize that there are certain inherent things that we need to survive. And, you know, part of the biointensive design is like looking at, you know, what needs to go back into the soil as far as nutrition and into the plants and as well as our body. So, you know, one connection that's able to be made is, you know, now we're planting for, we're, we're kind of equating the self, like ourselves to plants where we know what we need to feed the plants. And now we know what we need to feed ourselves. And it all kind of comes together through a design like this. Um, so there are basically, there's like a basic formula to doing this that I'm just gonna to touch on briefly. Um, so it's, if we're able to do this, grow our own food, you know, for under an acre or less of land, it's kind of broken down into 60, 30, 10%, you know, 60% of the land that we're gonna grow 
on, you know, we're going to plant in like a carbon or a high calorie or compost crop. And, you know, often these plants that we're using uh, check a box in each of these categories. So 60% of that will be high calorie carbon crops. 30% will be kind of specialty root crops, which are kind of nutrient dense, calorically dense um, uh, veg, you know, plants that don't take up a lot of space, but you know, they don't require a lot of labor to grow, yet you're able to pull out a, a lot of calories from those uh, doing so with minimal impact. And then the last 10% will be your crops, like your vegetable crops. Um, so these are things where you're gonna get your vitamins and your minerals from, but at the same time, you know, these aren't necessary, these are more, to me, these were more like of the appealing crops, you know. I'd rather grow tomatoes and leafy greens and, and uh, you know, cucumbers, right? But when I designed my diet for the year, I was eating a lot of burdock and a lot of sweet potatoes and uh, Can you repeat the formula um, again of the percentages of crops. I, I think that would be a really interesting thing for people to, to hear again. Uh, abs absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, out of like 100% of, of your growing space, 60% um, of that space would be for growing um, carbon crops, say. So, like grains, um, high crops that are, you know, have a high caloric value. Um, but they also can be utilized for making compost as well. Um, so that 60% is your carbon crop, 30% is your specialty root crop, um, which are the nutri or the, the calorically dense crops. And then 10% would be kind of your veggie, your vegetable production, your, um, you know, your, your, your greens and your tomatoes and, and the, the crops that are going to have a nutri or a, a mineral and vitamin dense content. Um, so, you know, that kind of takes into account the diet aspect of what's happening. Um, incorporated within this too, um, would be growing crops, medicinal crops and income crops as well. Now, I've kind of adapted the, the, the formula because what I realized after studying this was like this model can kind of apply or can be utilized in, in kind of a grander vision how, how it best suits your needs and what you're doing. Um, so there are ways to kind of make it more viable to the specific goals that you have um, on your farm. But, you know, the 60%, the, the 30%, 10% model is what kind of has to hold true through all of this. Um, because the basic premise of this is we're taking away from the land okay how do we create a more of a closed loop system while doing this because one of the biggest things is we're trying to reduce the amount by farming this way is to reduce the amount of input that we're bringing taking from off-site you know we're closing the loop um so by doing by planting this way we're able to kind of uh, bring everything back home and we're not having to pull as many resources off of the land and that's where like the carbon farming comes into play and composting. And through those different, different tech, you know, ways of composting um, and farming for that specific reason, uh, uh, for the, the kind of wheat crops or your, your cereal types of crops, there's also uh, ways to utilize certain crops for like cover cropping or um, overwintering crops. And some of these specific crops can be also used for, for food as well. Um, the, the thing that I found most challenging with this was in fact, like how do you determine the ratios of a car? Like how do you know what you're taking out of the soil, what you need to put back into the soil? Um, what are your carbon and nitrogen needs? What nutrients have, do you have to replenish? Um, and the interesting thing about farming this way was there are, um, and I can, I can post later, but there are basically, there's a whole sort of formula that's been developed in, there's a whole, their sheets and formulas to be able to figure all of this out based upon the amount of land that you're using and what types of crops that you're farming. So it, through those formulas, you can then figure out exactly what you need to plant back into the land to replenish the soil for what you're going to grow next. Um, it, it's, it's all really interesting. And it, it, these are things that I never really, really thought about um, because we can all grow 
we, we can then grow our compost and we can put our cover crops in. But I didn't exactly understand what that was doing as far as translating that to what I was taking out, what my needs were and what I was able to bring back and put into the soil. Um, so, you know, obviously this type of farming, biointensive farming, um, it, you know, I hate to use the word organic, but it's essentially, you know, we're, we're, we're farming in a way, in a sustainable way where we're not using uh, any synthetic chemicals or fertilizers. You know, it's all, you know, recycling organic matter through crop rotation. And this relies on a very, this relies on a lot of engagement with the farmer. Like we have to be connected to what we're doing uh, and, kind of, and, and rooted in the land, which at times, you know, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to be doing that. So, uh, there are just there there are ways there there are ways that we can we can kind of make up for such things. But the basic you know the the other ideas are we're having integrated plant and nutrition management and integrated pest management through this way as well, where we're not in order to rely less heavily on outside resources, we're able to create our own nutrients and foods that are needed for the land, as well as we're using. Um, plants that attract beneficial insects, um, planting in ways that are, are helping to reduce uh, the molds and mildews that can happen, as well as use, uh, utilizing the seed stock that we're creating that are more bioregionally acclimatized uh, to be less susceptible to these things. And for us here, planting um, for hemp with the feral type of genetics that we're planting, it fits really well into this model because these are these are strains of hemp that have been grown uh, in the United States, in America for, you know, 100 plus years, and they are extremely well adapted to uh, the varying climate and um, issues that come up with, with farming uh, in the States. Um, so, you know, this is, this is kind of one of the ways that I see being able to integrate my income into farming for both myself and my family. Um, because I never, you know, looking back and seeing, well, what, a, okay, so one of the things that I, I want to study further is how by planting hemp and my food crops, what does that actually do? How do I create a symbiosis in that world to be able to, to you know, plant companion plants? What are the best types of cover crops to use? Um, how do I do this in a way that is, is more sustainable? And how do I figure out how to do that and give back uh, to what I've taken out of the land. And this is giving kind of a generalized idea of what to do. And now, you know, we might not be able to follow every premise exactly, but this um, definitely sets a framework to do so because for before, you know, we can all just plant and, you know, we could do it in a way that, that I, you know, that think we think is sustainable and giving back to the land. But, um, it's nice to know exactly, to the best of our knowledge, what is coming out and what needs to go back into the land. And, you know, this is taken in, like when I say like a systems approach, you know, we're, we're using this way, we're taking this model of biointensive food farming and uh, growing our medicinal crops and our income crops, and we're taking it and putting it into a, like a whole systems approach as if we're using like our permaculture principles. And we're, we're be designing gardens and farms like this based upon those models and methodologies. Um, so, you know, it's basically just one of those things where by following this, for me, it was by following this model of food farming, um, it's helping to cultivate, you know, a deeper relationship with what we're doing and an understanding of what we are taking away. And it's also helping to create the connection of the farmer to the land and the community. Because one of the, I didn't think I was going to find myself here in Connecticut. And as I do, I'm realizing that, you know, people don't, there's a lot of people that don't understand what, you know, that every, they don't understand like what, it takes to make to do what we're doing to be able to produce the food that they're consuming there's a lot of money there's a lot of resources but you know nobody know understands the community of it all and i'm seeing this because coming from where i was in, in northern california to here it, it it's a totally different world 
Um, and it's really allowing me to think about what I studied years ago and like start to really put it into perspective as I run this nursery and how do I run a nursery sustainably? Like how am I going to create and generate the resources that I need to cultivate the plants here uh, that we're growing? Um, so this is a model that we're trying to create. We're going to be working on a two acre piece of land here in, in Kent, Connecticut soon that we're going to develop and create this model of sustainability here um, to show the multiple layers of, of, of planting, utilizing native plants, using perennial crops, uh, catching wa rainwater, um, uh, using uh, cover crops and just, just, showing that there is more of a there's a different way to do things and especially times like now where things are crazy people are feeling maybe a disconnect to others there's not a lot of connection um happening you know one thing we talk about at the nursery here is reaching out to people creating a model of of culti growing food not fear and cultivating the future so when daniel talks about setting up a victory garden, we talk about like a pandemic victory garden. How do we then, like now more than ever, when you go outside, generating that connection to the land, and if you're able to do that and grow your food that you're then sharing with your family and your income while you're maybe stuck at home and, you know, you can grow a hemp crop and possibly in six months you're able to utilize that for, for medicinal purposes or for, you know, to generate some sort of an income building models like that to share with people. But in the end, by doing this to it, like in, in uh, keeping with the theme of the conference and, and biosecurity and bioethics, we're then able to kind of take back something that was, was maybe taken from us, which is the power to create the ability for ourselves to cultivate food and medicine and income for us so it, it really does feel like we're we're kind of taking control um and one of the big things that we can do is is share seed you know that's one thing we're going to be working on here this summer as well is breeding our own genetics and saving our own seed both for vegetables and for hemp so we're then able to you know create kind of a local seed bank for people to tap and farmers to tap into because you know the main doing this was just to create connection with the farmers that we work with so they're able to provide for their families and they're able to give back to the the environment that that is here and you know just take a different perspective on what they're doing and just kind of uh yeah just kind of bring it back to you know creating that closed loop small micro farming type of a system that i feel by doing this you know we're we're going to be able to um decrease the reliance that we have on others and, and bring it more back into a localized sense of, of economy there. So, um, yeah, I think that's all that I have to share right now, but so I'd cool. like to turn it actually, hold on. I wanted to bring it back to Daniel because one of the reasons I was truly excited about participating in this was I followed a lot of farms over the years. Um, and Daniel's farm was actually one of them. And I just really appreciate folks who are living what I'm talking about. Cause right now I'm not farming on the scale or I'm not growing all of my own food. Uh, I'm working towards that, but I'm building the nursery and Daniel is actually and his family at their farm is taking what I'm talking about and they're, they're, they're turning it into action. And that's something that I truly respect and I'm and really, really honored to be a part of. And, now Daniel's going to talk a little bit about his experience. Cool. Thanks so much, Chris. That was that was awesome and really informative. I I for for many decades have really loved uh, the biointensive uh, farming technique and and uh, the first farming book I ever had was John Jevons' How to Grow More Vegetables <laughs> and uh, used it like a, a a bible for for years of, of reference. Uh, back when uh, we just had a, a small garden and a few cannabis plants tied down with fake flowers all through them. <laughs> some, some decades ago, um, we were, we were uh, really closely following uh, the double digging and, and the biointensive methods. And over the years, our farm has evolved into um, a, 
about three quarters of an acre of, of production vegetables and a small uh, 5,000 square foot cannabis farm. And um, we've focused a lot on how to integrate these things together. And, and although we started with our farming on the uh, providing for ourselves on the, on the homestead level as, as we've become a, a production uh, market garden, uh, those uh, scales of, of the 60, uh, 30, 10 have, have shifted a little bit because we, we grow a lot more lettuce and, and things like that that are really nice for people to get fresh. But um, one, of the, one of the things that's amazing here in, in Humboldt County is that even though we're not growing crops year round, we, we have this ability to have, a, 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 we have a mild winter, so we can grow it. A, a tremendous amount of our carbon for our soil um, during the winter time here with cover cropping. And um, a big part of our focus of the last few years is how to effectively cover crop in our different farming systems and how to effectively um, bring that cover crop material, all that carbon that's created through winter photosynthesis um, back into the soil. Um, and with a a big focus for us on on no-till farming. So how can we do this with the minimum soil disturbance possible? How can we leave the, the natural balance um, that, that nature provides in, in the complexity of soil life as, as much intact as possible? Um, I'd like to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a screen share. I have a really brief uh, slideshow, but I'm gonna go through it slowly and, and talk about what's going on in each of these slides with folks as we do it. So uh, bear with me for a second as, as I get this up and going. Um, here, there we go. Okay, so, um, this slide is um, our, our food farm kind of in the background and compost piles. We make um, about uh, 40 yards of on-farm compost a year out of, out of goat manure, crop debris, uh, some local hay. And um, in the picture, we, we are converting cover cropped cannabis beds to um, to be able to plant them. So mowing down cover crops, spreading compost on top. And, and uh, these days we, we, we actually don't mow it. We, we crimp the cover crops. So this is from a couple of years ago. And then in between the cannabis beds, we have spring crops of, of food going. And one of the neat things about working with cannabis in a farming system or hemp for that matter, is it, it's a crop that's in the ground for a really long time and starts very small and, and ends the season um, as, as big as you want it to be, but on our farm, a, a, a 12 foot by 10 foot wide crop. So you have all this um, space and soil available to you on the farm throughout the first part of the year to be able to grow food crops. For us, we, we grow multiple rotations of, of spring crops, uh, lettuce, arugula, radishes, things like that, and get an early um, marketable crop in the spring into summer. And then um, have those beds, as the cannabis starts to shade them out, go into a summer cover crop of buckwheat that can be mowed down or cut and used as a mulch on, on the cannabis beds for a little extra fertility going into flower time. Um, talking about whole food, uh, what we eat in the closed loops, um, one of the things we do is when we leaf cannabis or prune, we, we uh, feed it to our goats and our goats um, are a big part of our food supply. We get, we get milk, we make cheese, we get meat. And the goats also provide us with a lot of um, fire safety security around our farm. So it's a, a really um, good relationship for a farm to have farm animals to provide fertility and, and to be able to, to use some of the excess uh, crop to make food for us. Um, here's the, the cannabis getting planted in that garden. Um, with every other bed, uh, a food crop and cannabis in between. One of the things we also do occasionally is plant food crops in between the cannabis on the cannabis rows 
Although um, this season, what we're doing is with those from cannabis plants that start out 10 feet apart from each other and end up touching by the end of the season is, is planting auto flower so that in the same square footage that we have um, for our, our license, we can get a, a mid season uh, crop out of the same space uh, and then that's removed in time for the for the full term to grow up and fill in that space and so this is a lettuce bed cannabis bed and and a bed of cutting greens i, I believe arugula behind it um on our our main food farm that we do for market um we we use a a, a no to low till system we um we use a broad fork to aerate the soil, but we don't mix the layers and we, we do a lot of cover cropping and high carbon on the surface, um, mimicking uh, the natural process where the soil isn't flipped and there, there would be duff, crop debris, um, tree leaves, grass, things like that on the soil surface and uh, earthworms will come up and, and bring it down. So instead of relying on tilling or flipping beds to integrate the nutrients, the, the biomass into the soil, we're relying on the biology to do that. Um, as I was talking about cover crop for, for building biomass, for being that carbon crop of giving back to the soil, um, this is uh, a cover crop mix we plant often uh, cayuse oats is the, the cereal grain that grows up fast in the fall and grabs a lot of the nutrients before the winter rains can wash them out here. And then a number of different leguminous crops that can both grow up and use the, the uh, oat as a, a trellis sort of, but also um, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and uh, provide nitrogen for the following season's fertility. Just some more farm shots. Um, we are, we're farming on, you know, what would generally be considered marginal land. It, it's flat, but not perfectly flat. It's surrounded by forest, uh, not really in the bottom lands. But um, we started out with some pretty decent soil and, and we've continued to um, build the soil up year by year by adding as much organic material as possible. And one of the goals um, for us has been to, to transition from traditional um, tilling or turning of soil encourages uh, a bacterially dominant soil. Um, bacterially dominant soil, um, it, it provides a lot of nutrients, but breaks them down quickly. So they are available sh for a short time. Um, when you transition a, a soil to a, a fungal dominant soil, and, and that you do by adding a lot of organic matter onto the surface by mulching, composting, and by not disturbing the soil profile, um, mushrooms in general have the ability to break down higher carbon material in slower and into a more stable organic matter. So, um, for sequestering carbon without adding a lot of nitrogen from off farm, um, creating a fungal dominant soil is ideal. And especially with cannabis and uh, hemp, there have been a number of studies that show that, that cannabis highly prefers a, a, a fungally dominant soil and produces um, more abundant terpenes, more abundant cannabinoids with, with a higher fungal balance. It's kind of an overview of one of our main cannabis planting areas with the, the cannabis mulched in the spring and, uh, and food crops planted in between. Uh, the greenhouse is our starts nursery for the farm. Um, crops of yarrow. So um, in addition, we really work for our IPM program at always having uh, flowering plants available. And, and stacking functions, a, a, a lot of this is about, um, about growing your own medicine too. And, and one of the neat things about growing medicine is oftentimes uh, the crops that provide really good herbal medicine also provide flowers for beneficial insects and also provide beauty for your farm and can also provide fertility. Um, 
this yarrow here, one of the things we do with it is cut it and ferment it to make a, an FPJ, a fermented plant juice that can be used to, to fertilize the, the um, cannabis during the mid season. And we, we do that with a lot of the crops that are abundant. We'll, we'll cut them and uh, make a tea with them to, to feed back to the garden. The yarrow especially is, is a great crop for beneficial insects. Any of these uh, umble flowers with the uh, umble like umbrella, these small dome, domed flowers um, are an especially good habitat for beneficial insects. Beneficial insects um, being uh, predators that um, are able to predate on, on aphids, on, on thrips, on other cannabis pests are often insects that in their adult stage eat nectar and pollen from flowers. And so if you have the flowers, they're hanging out there uh, in their ideal habitat, well fed, and then they lay their larva on the pest. So um, there's a number of, of uh, predatory wasps, uh, surfid flies, uh, ladybugs, various insects like that, that, that given the right environment, will will make a, a home in your farm and then, uh, yeah, then then predate on, uh, on your cannabis pests. So here we have a stacking of functions. Between the cannabis plants, we have um, a, a crop of lettuce coming up. And then in the background was a crop of arugula that was allowed to go to seed to, um, provide a habitat for beneficial insects right there in the cannabis garden and then also to provide seed that we can collect to to plant our crop the next year. Uh, and then this is a um, a crop of cilantro between the cannabis plants and so that planted um, around now, I believe, in, in early April, um, was a crop that we were able to harvest multiple times and have it regrow, uh, bring the cilantro to market and, and uh, freeze a lot of it for ourselves for the winter time, and then let it go to seed. And cilantro is an especially uh, amazing uh, forage crop for beneficial insects and for, for bees and, and native pollinators. Um, I, I had, at, at one time gone out to check on, on the cilantro and discovered, I believe, 12 different species uh, of insects on, on a, a one foot by one foot square area, eating pollen and nectar from the cilantro. And uh, there's a bumblebee in the foreground on, on tithonia, that orange flower is tithonia or Mexican sunflower. Um, and then talking about the diversity of, of planting for, for income. For us, um, we, uh, we plant our, our food crops for ourselves, but also as, a, um, as an alternative income stream, uh, apart from our cannabis, we feel part of our giving back to our community is providing food and it also brings in a little bit of income throughout the year to, to, to help us keep going. I, I know one of the, the challenges with cannabis um, is that the income comes in big blocks and, and with a long time in between. So um, it's nice as a veggie farmer to be able to have uh, income continuously coming in every week throughout the season as we do farmers markets or, or CSAs or, or restaurant sales. Uh, here's a picture of, of making some on-farm compost. And we're back around. So I'm going to stop this screen share and go back to this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't have uh, too much else prepared. I would love to um, open it up and, and to see if anybody has questions for myself or Chris about what we're talking about or, or things they'd like to know more about. Feel free to chat it up and um, and ask us anything you want. Daniel had a question. Um, what percentage of your yeah. farm goes to family food for market and compost? Uh, well, I'd say 
it, it's hard to tease apart. We we just eat out of the farm, uh, kind of as much as we want. We we um, have two other folks who are interns living living here on the farm who also um, get as much food as they want from the farm. We do about uh, twenty five to thirty CSA shares and uh, two farmers markets, as well as um, a few previously a few restaurant uh, contracts. Um, and as far as the compost, we do bring quite a bit off farm for our compost. We use goat manure, but um, we buy organic local alfalfa to feed the goats. And then we also buy local grass hay, um, about a hundred bales of hay a year to mix with the goat manure and add to the compost and um, also get some local organic uh, dairy cow manure. Um, part of it for us is, is the trying to, to run a market farm as a business, we really are, are trying to maximize all of our space that we can grow on. So um, if we were doing this as a, uh, just to feed our family, I think we would grow about half as much space as we do and keep the other half in, in growing compost and forage crops. Um, I've got a couple questions that I can ask to you. Um, okay. Allison asks, I'm curious, what do you think the role of distributors like Flocana are and can be in promoting this approach to mixed food cannabis farming? Well, um, Flocana was a big supporter of the CSA model. Um, last year, when Flocana was operating the Whitethorn production facility, um, we provided 100% off of our farm uh, CSA shares for all the all of the folks working there at Whitethorn. And then I know Flocana also provides CSA to all of their employees through the Mendocino Food Hub, which supports um small sometimes cannabis and sometimes just just food farms diversified farms in mendocino county um in addition flocana helped to to spearhead the start of a project which is now uh, an independent project sun and earth certified that came out of a collaboration between flocana um uh, dr Bronner's, uh and the brother david's brand and is now an independent uh uh inspection-based certification program certifying uh, regeneratively grown cannabis. And part of that certification is having, um, having forage crops for beneficial insects, having a diversified production. Uh, it, it doesn't require that you grow food for market, but it does require that, that you do grow some other crops besides cannabis for, for your farm. Um. Aaron Larson has a question. Where do you start with garden design? <laughs> what do you want to eat? Um, I think that's the biggest, biggest place to start. What do you want to eat and how much space do you have? If you, if you have a, a container garden and you love pesto uh, and it's just your window still in your apartment, plant some basil. Um, if you love fresh salads um, and you've got a, a light depth farm, plant one of those beds and lettuce for the winter for you to eat. Um, there, there's all kinds of, of, of things that are available. And, and the biggest thing is, is what provides you joy will be what you put the energy into. Um, so as far as design, it, there's a lot of resources. There's a lot available folks you can talk to, but yeah, start, start with, with what what makes you hungry when you think about it. Perfect. Um, can Steve Lowe asks, can you explain the FPJ in more detail? How do you make it? What plants do you use? How is it applied to the garden? Well, um, well, we don't follow a sp specific traditional FPJ. Like we're not um, practitioners in Korean natural farming, but um, what we've been doing lately uh, which has evolved over the years is is pretty much any plant. I do it. I, I love doing it with with stinging nettles, with with comfrey, with those traditional plants you do it with. But 
when I mow my lawn in the spring and there's an area with a bunch of clover and fresh grass, I'll take that. And what I do is by, by weight, I add about a quarter of the weight of the plant mass in sugar. And primarily that is to activate the bacteria and also to, to provide like uh, an osmotic uh, drawing out of, of the juices from the plant. Similar to um, if you've ever made sauerkraut or ferments, you, you add salt to it and that draws the moisture out of the cabbage. So um, you mix your plant material, you chop it up real fine. I do that on a chopping block with a machete. You could do it, it, it you could tear it up by, by hand. I'll put it in a five gallon bucket tossed with the sugar with the weight on top of it it will pull the the vital juices out of the plant and and you'll have a, a brine of sorts that is um, the juices pulled out of the cells of the plants you can also add a little bit of uh, of water if you want we often add uh, whey because we make cheese a lot with with our goat milk and that um, kind of jump starts the bacterial process, but there are bacteria there and it'll, it'll do its thing naturally. Um, after a few weeks, we strain the liquids off of the solids uh, of those fermented plant juices. Um, a five gallon bucket full of, of plant solids will, will make about a gallon to a gallon and a half of, of a, a thick uh, viscous liquid. Um, and we add that to foliar sprays at about one to 500. So uh, one part FPJ to 500 parts water. Um, so pretty dilute and we'll spray that on plants about, about once a week, um, especially in the early stages in the nursery when they're in pots and don't have access to as much uh, soil and minerals and, and whatnot. Okay, Russell Pace has a question. Do, do you use dynamic accumulators as fertilizer? It appears that plants like nettle, yarrow, and comfrey make excellent fertilizers, but the amount of space you need to grow enough plants to support your fertilization seems to be two to one. What are your thoughts? Speaking specifically to create a dry powdered amendment as fertilizer, not FPJ. So um, we've never done a dried powdered amendment for uh, for our plants with dynamic accumulators, um, like you'd said, I, I believe it would be something like a two to one ratio to to be able to provide that. And in the end, it very much feels like you just would be mining one area to provide for another, because um, they are pulling minerals and nutrients out of the soil. Um, and making them bioavailable, but it is still pulling it out of the soil. Um, our approach has been just with an FA and just as a supplement for the garden, um, whereas compost, uh, which comes from our animals, which are, are feeding over a larger area, wood chips um, and wood for which we put in our hugel beds and things like that are, are more where we bring the, the mass of our nutrients in. Um, one of our focuses with the dynamic accumulators, such as such as comfrey and, and nettle and, and yarrow, has been as a supplement, but then also um, thoughtful placement. Um, our land isn't exactly flat, and we know um, where the drainages are on our land. So, so where where the nutrient flow would be, and and where the spots where where water leaves our cultivated areas and and leaves our gardens either through groundwater or on the surface. And, and we've built beds um, with uh, hugel culture techniques, putting, putting wood in those beds and, and building up uh, lush beds in those areas. The, the wood as a sponge to, to kind of catch some of that water flow and catch, catch some of those nutrients, especially the first flushes in the fall, and then having dynamic accumulators there that we can um, used to catch any nutrients that would be leaving our farm into the system, cut those dynamic accumulators, bring them back up to the top of the system in the form of compost to put back in the soil. And in that way, it's, it's um, for us very much like the last net to make sure that nutrients that will be a big benefit to us on our farm don't leave our farm to be a detriment in, in the, the water ecology system downstream. 
I love that. That's great. Um, M asks, do you have an opinion on Hugel culture raised beds? I, yeah, I love them, uh, especially for cannabis. Um, we don't do all of our cannabis with Hugel culture. We, we've, um, on our farm, reserved Hugel culture for areas that had more marginal soil and needed to be built up. So um, we absolutely love them for, for cannabis. We feel like it grows incredible cannabis. And for a home gardener trying to grow uh, food for yourself rather than a market garden approach, it, it can be a really good source of cannabis and food. Like um, in our Hugel cultures, we plant cannabis and then there's a number of perennial fruit food crops that are interplanted in the same beds with the cannabis, such as um, artichokes and, and squash and pumpkins growing underneath and, and flowers and other crops. And we also used our Hugel culture beds as a, a place uh, away from our main market garden to, to grow seed crops that won't have as much cross pollination with, with some of the farm crops. If you're, um, what we've found for ourselves, if we're growing for production for market gardening, we uh, don't prefer Hugel cultures because um, they're a little harder to work with, to plant, to, to weed, to harvest. So for efficiency for market farming, we, we prefer just a, a no-till straight 30 inch uh, beds in zones. But um, the cannabis responds really well to the Hugel culture. And then we've, we've shifted to managing some of our non-Hugel culture beds that we grow cannabis in to uh, a similar style. We, we used to shift our cannabis back and forth with, uh, with other beds. And we discovered that, that cannabis, unlike a lot of crops, if you can deal with um, the, the pest pressure, then cannabis likes growing in the same spot it grew um, as well with that. Um, so some of our non hugo culture beds, we've started going in, in like a lasagna gardening sort of a way where, um, where we just layer on top. It, it's heavily mulched and then instead of pulling the mulch off to plant cover crop, we put compost on top of the mulch and put our cover crop seeds into that compost or manure, grow a cover crop, um, we use um, crimping to, to break that cover crop down just to get it flat without uh, tearing it up so that it breaks down slowly and provides an environment and then just layer more compost and more mulch on top of it um, so that we're constantly building up and never breaking into that, um, that balanced soil layer. So we're coming up on 12 o'clock. I think we can go until about 12.15. And we have uh, four more questions that have come in. Um, and Nathan Volkers asks, do you have any authors or literature that you can recommend about biointensive farming? Chris, do you wanna? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, you know, I definitely like, like Daniel mentioned, you know, the Bible is, is by John Jevin, how to grow more vegetables, which is probably in it's like 40th edition somewhere, who knows, but that really is going to be like one of the main building blocks of, of this, this system. Um, you know, I would always recommend the, the, the permaculture manual, Bill Mollison's permaculture manual is kind of yet another staple or Bible. Um, and I would check into a few books like, you know, like Masanobu Fukuoka, like, like One Straw Revolution, like take some of these older kind of, you know, some, some of the older literature and principles and, and kind of start there um, to, to really uh, assess the old principles of what we're building, we keep building on as we, we develop these, these different types of systems. But as far as like getting into it, I think, yeah, how to, how to grow more vegetables is kind of is, is your basic uh, book. Um, I would definitely get some sort of a handbook as far as like a, an organic gardening, uh, pests and insects. I think there's one, Pests of the, the Garden and Small Farm, which is a really good book. And then 
a couple other books to get more in depth are from, I think, uh, it's Jeff Lowenfeld, right? How to, teaming with microbes and, and teaming with nutrients are a few really interesting books. Um, and whatever region you're into, I know that there's a lot of gardening books that are kind of based on biointensive um, gardening, but they're adapted to your local zone or climate. And uh, you can find those pretty much anywhere. Like, for example, like, in the, the zones of Northern California, there was a really great book called Golden Gate Gardening, which just was like kind of a step-by-step -step guide of what to plant. In these zones that are like a little bit more of a coastal cool that are a little bit trickier to plant in, but they'll give you like suggestions on how to plant and what to plant and when, um, which, uh, you know, and then to successively plant or interplanting and companion planting, which is, which is, is really helpful. And that's one of the great things about how to grow more vegetables though is he kind of covers everything from plant spacing to how to replenish the soil to like what plants go well with one another it's kind of just a a, a tell-all of of how to do it the the bio-intensive way and I, I recommend it and chris would you do us a favor and kind of uh write up your bit of your bibliography and post it in the webinar chat while we absolutely put another couple questions Absolutely. Awesome. Um, Allison asks, what was, what has your history, what is your history with autoflowers? Are they a recent addition to your production system? No history at all. We're just playing around with it right now. Um, I had started some last year with the intention of doing it and, and got busy. So um, I just planted some seeds um, of the uh, Magic Melon Autoflower from Humboldt Seed Company um, just this morning, put them in the ground and uh, um, we're, we're experimenting. It's, it's part of the fun of, of farming for us is trying something new all the time. Um, Stephen Luther asks, could, you, could these methods be scaled up to a medium sized farm with an acre of row cropped cannabis cultivation? Absolutely. Um, I think that it would take some experimentation with, with, with a medium-sized farm um, of, of an acre of cannabis. A, a big part of it is, is how you deal with your efficiencies, and a big part of farming it is efficiency. But um, I, I think it, it is very doable. That's been a big part of our, our focus with the food farming is efficiency and integrating that with cannabis, uh, I think, works great. And, and any of these methods are scalable. It's just uh, figuring out the nuts and bolts of how that scale works for you. Awesome. Um, for the attendees, if you have any remaining questions, if you can add them into the question and answer or in the chat panel, that would be awesome. Um, and with that, Morgan has a question. How long does it take for the ideal Google Culture Mound to become productive? Um, what I've heard uh, is three years is ideal, but um, uh, we've had great success with productivity on the first year with Hugo Culture, and I think part of that is designing it with that in mind. So we, we started our Hugo Culture mounds with about half and half uh, fresh wood and, and well decomposed wood. Um, from the forest that already had uh, mycelium and fungal growth on it. Um, and then we made sure to add lots of little wood and added in uh, manure and compost with the wood layer so that it wouldn't steal too much of the nutrients in the, in the early decomposition of the wood. But last year we finished a group of hugels in June, planted them out immediately and uh, had a really good successful run with them. Um, awesome. Aaron Larson has says we've been concerned about monoculture in our cannabis farms. Sounds like they might actually like it as long as there's variety and companion planting. Yes and no. I mean there's a difference between planting in the same state space and mono monoculture. Um, but yeah, if, if there's companion planting, if, if there is diversity in the soil. So, you know, I would say that they like to grow in the same spot when done correctly. And, and to me, that's 
uh, returning all of the carbon. So, so chipping the cannabis up, putting the chips back on the bed. It's making sure there are other plants in that same bed, in that same soil. So there's, there's companion plants, flowers, all of that, not just in a separate area, but, but sharing some of that root zone. Um, uh, you know, and most of the thoughts I have about that are anecdotal. I believe cannabis creates fungal relationships. So if you're uh, rototilling, that kind of uh, would negate some of those benefits of cannabis growing back in the same spot that it, it's not um, developing those fungal relationships that stay on the roots. Um, one of the, the things that I think is beneficial, I mean, obviously if uh, there's any disease pressure or viral pathology or anything like that, it negates some of these things. But, but what we try to do is, is cut our cannabis and leave the stalks and the roots in place to decompose over the winter. And they'll be there enough the next season that you, um, you have to plant, you know, six inches to the side. But then all of those fungal relationships that built up with that cannabis is right there for the plant the next season. Um, but I think on overall farm level, if you were to look at your farm from the top and you see 95% of the canopy being cannabis, um, it's not providing the environmental diversity that, that helps the whole ecosystem as well. But um, yeah, I, the, the concept, like the idea of that really um, came, it, it, it stems from observing the way cannabis has evolved. You, you know, you see cannabis uh, hemp as a ditch weed in the Midwest and it it seeds out millions of seeds, drops them right in the place. Some get carried off, but most of them sprout and grow back in that same place the next year. And you see really vibrant, healthy stands of uh, feral cannabis, and it's growing year after year after year in its own footsteps. So that's where that uh, anecdotal concept comes from. Awesome, awesome. Um, Daniel or Chris, do you have any closing comments that you'd like to wrap up with? <laughs> um, well, I just appreciate, I really appreciate being here. And I guess one thing, yeah, just to close with is like the question of, you know, what, what should I plant? It's just one of those, those things where like Daniel said is like, just plant what you want, plant what you can, you know, this, this type of farming that we're talking about is, is something that is, can be as accessible as to you as you want it to be. Like um, anybody can plant and grow a garden, it, no matter how much space that they have, whether it's a container garden or a half acre or five acres. Um, but this is just one way to, for us to like create and regain that connection that we have to like the land and our, our, our food security and our, and our local food source as well as to others around us you know so being able to to do this um really just helps to foster that connection and it's a way to to really perpetuate our own sustainability and how we see ourselves kind of in the world and, and how we interact and you know in relation to being able to su sustain ourselves and our families you know i believe that that the w where the world is heading is is you know we're all going to have to know how to plant this way or plant food and grow food for ourselves and do it in a way that is is giving back to to the community and to to the earth so yeah thank you thank you chris yeah, um I, I would say similarly, uh, one of the exciting things for me about being part of the, the cannabis industry is where we are a new industry um, and we have this opportunity to, to create our part in this industry in a, in a different pattern. Our, our industrial culture and industrial agriculture uh, specifically has uh, really failed us all. It's, um, it's destroying the planet. It's mining the topsoil. It, it's, it's doing everything wrong, including making us unhealthy because of the lack of true nutrition in the food that's provided. So as cultivators of cannabis, we can choose to cultivate in a way that fundamentally changes that relationship with nature and that relationship with medicine. And, and, takes back from we've kind of contracted out our lives and our food 
to um, large industrial agriculture and um, that they, they are, are not worthy of that responsibility. Um, so as we take that responsibility back um, in growing our medicine, growing our cannabis and growing our food, we, we take back our own individual power to define ourselves as separate from an extractive culture and um, as part of a, a culture that gives back and, and that is sustainable in the long run for, for us, for our health, for our, commu for our community and, and for our ecosystem. Um, and it's, it's a really exciting time to be part of this. Um, and uh, I'd love to continue the discussion. If anybody has more questions, um, you can always contact me uh, through our website, uh, brycelandforestfarm.com, through our Instagram, which is uh, Bryceland Forest Farm, or, um, or any other way you can find. Uh, it, I really uh, love talking about it and love sharing this stuff with folks. So. Well, we love having you here. This is wonderful. And uh, Jesse Dodd has a question, which is what lessons can farms learn from the current COVID situation? Tie that back in with what you were just saying. Yeah, uh, basically, Jesse, love, love hearing your voice, even, even translated through Natalie. Uh, I, I think the biggest lesson is that this, it's a house of cards. We've, we've built a, 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 an unsustainable system and all it takes is one break in, in a very delicate chain to make our, our, our supply chain not work for us. And that to be, um, to be truly self-sustaining as individuals and as community, we have to really look at what our needs are, whether the, the you know, whether that means buying a bidet so you don't need to, to rely on toilet paper or, or growing some food yourself. So, so when there is a time when, when there's a, a break in the supply of food, you can provide for yourself because, you know, this is a uh, one situation, but, but here on the North coast, we're aware of all of these potential situations, whether it be uh, large earthquakes or other natural disasters or fires. And our system really isn't well equipped to deal with multiple uh, natural disasters at the same time. So if, if there are hurricanes on the East Coast at the same time there's an earthquake and fire here, we wouldn't really have the resources we need for quite a while to deal with it. And think about uh, what resources, what you need to live and what you need to support um, the vulnerable people in your community and, and your community as a whole, and then take whatever baby steps it is towards doing that. Um, you know, everything, everything helps. Support local farmers, sign up for a CSA, plant some basil in a, in a flower box on, on your deck. You know, it, it, it's all reconnecting with our basic, uh, our basic needs. And I think that's where we start to build the foundation back up for a sustainable culture. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I is, um, I'm in the process of building out a garden in my own backyard and I feel more inspired to go start digging today after this kind of talk. Um, I want to thank everybody that has uh, logged in today. Uh, I will send out this recording as well as um, I'm going to get bibliography information from Daniel and Chris to share with everybody um, for best books on Google culture and growing more vegetables. So we'll send that out to everybody that uh, registered for this event. We'll post this, uh, this recording on our website probably by the end of beginning of next week after all of these have been recorded. And uh, I do want to remind people that tomorrow we have viruses, viroids, and pathology. This is going to be a deep dive into plant pathology, talking about bacteria, fungal, pathogens, viruses, and viroids, um, learning what the difference is and why should cannabis farmers be informed. Um, Attendees will learn how to test for different pathogens, the importance of quarantine of new plants, and the benefits of protecting your crop. Sounds kind of like what we're doing as humans right now. And 
This is all presented by Annalisa Fabritas, PhD from ANL Crop Solutions and moderated by Joanna Berg of Dirty Business Soil. So that's tomorrow at 11. If you have not already registered, do so at HCGA's website and make sure to tune in today for our 420 celebration at four o'clock. Thank you everyone.